A warm welcome to everyone on behalf of the trustees, the director general, and the staff of CSMBS. We are glad that we could bring you another interesting talk by an esteemed scholar, Dr. Kumud Kanitkar, a friend and a supporter of CSMBS. Interestingly, she holds a PhD in chemistry from the University of Massachusetts and retired as a professor in chemistry in 2004. After retirement, she became an independent researcher in Indology and her uh, research focuses on medieval temples in Maharashtra. Her works look beyond the aesthetic quality of sculptural art, trying to understand the meaning conveyed through the sculptural scream in an individual temple. Her 2013 book, Ambarnath Shivale, a monograph of the, on the temple of Shiv at Ambarnath, was awarded Ikuo Hirayama Prize in 2013 by the Institut de France, Académie des Inscriptions et Belas Letters, Paris. It was followed by a book in Marathi in the year 2014, Ambarnath Shivale. She had published numerous articles in research journals, presented papers at seminars and delivered lectures on the subjects such as temples of Mahar in Maharashtra, temple art as a means of non-verbal mass communication, medieval temple sculptures as makers of social history. Her latest book is bilingual on the Bhuleshwar temple near Yavad of the Pune uh, Sholapur Highway, Maharashtra, titled Bhuleshwar Shivale. This was published in the year of 2020. I now invite her to deliver a lecture. Over to you, Dr. Kanitkar. Okay, so you can see my uh, uh, page, right? That is the view of the uh, Bhuleshwar, uh, a very nice view. So I'm going to start. Yes, please start. And I request everyone, if you have any questions, kindly write it on the question uh, chat box and we will take the questions later on. Is the audio tick? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is where uh, the enigma starts right here. You can see the two little arrows, two little levels. Yes. Can you see the two arrows and the two levels? Yes, it is visible. Okay. So it's then uh, this number one. You see that Devakoshta, I'm going here to explain to you that it is not really a real Devakoshta. It's a fake Devakoshta. Only thing is they have put one in each corner of the wall, each uh, cardinal direction of the wall. And uh, when you take a close up, you find that the pillars on either side, the pillarets on either side are different. The designs are different. That means this is not really a, uh, it's a fake Devakoshta. Then one wonders why it has been painstakingly put in the wall. They could have just erected a wall and it's there in all four corners. So um, <clears throat> that is perhaps a clue they were leaving for us. And <clears throat> the temple from outside looks very, very simple Maratha period temple. But when you step inside, you can see that it has a it has a very elegant, uh, delicate structure. And this is the Nandi Mandap, which you can see the pillars are different type. And therefore, it is my contention that this is something added later. So the enigma of Buleshwar, actually, it should be, there are many questions, not just the whole thing is an enigma. For example, we have no evidence available. <clears throat> so we don't know who sponsored it. We don't know when it was built. We don't know why it was built, but we can conjecture because if we do not know the particular uh, sponsor of this particular temple, we know roughly the political religious history of the region. And from the extant visual clues, we can estimate the period of construction and the episodic panels point to a Nath Acharya whose goal was to educate the masses. So this is again repeating that, <clears throat> elaborating a little on the when part, uh, visual proofs, they 
are based on two or three different things. One is the lack of symmetry. Uh, the other one is the floor plan. And then you have different styles. And there are things that, that don't quite fit. So I'm calling them misfits. And why there are visual clues that provide uh, room for conjectures. And uh, this was meant to be for counseling the people, prabodhan, counseling not in the sense of the, uh, just to, how to live life. And this is by case studies method. I am calling it case studies method because <clears throat> you have to draw your own conclusions. And uh, the, when we come to the panels, you'll understand what I mean. I'm giving you one example of what I mean when I say that uh, we can resort to inscriptional historical data of the region. And I'm giving you uh, an example when uh, during this time, a little bit um, before this time, but the Guleshwar is about 1125. This is about 1069. The rulers were Yadavas. Remember, these are Yadavas. They are still the Yadavas of Seun Adesha. They have not yet become uh, the Yadavas of Devgiri. They are still the uh, feudatories of the Chalukyas of Kalyani. But they have built uh, temples and their, their feudatories in turn, like here it says there is a, a temple at Vagri in Chalisgav Taluka Khandesh district. And uh, this, the sponsor was a Maurya prince. Maurya is a minor dynasty, not the principal dynasty. Uh, Govinda Raja, he built a temple of Shiva called Siddheshanatha. And he gave a grant to it. And his sovereign lord, he mentions it, Mahamandalanatha Seuna, also gave a grant. So this conjecture that there's probably some feudatories of Yadavas, if not the Yadavas themselves. And these are the Yadavas who are in turn feudatories of Chalukyas at this time. And uh, this is again <clears throat> something visually uh, seen that it has gone through uh, damage twice and it has been restored also twice. <clears throat> First destruction, I do not know uh, what caused it. Uh, there is no clue as to what at that earlier time would have caused destruction, but the first <clears throat> excuse me, restoration is quite uh, clear. It was uh, done by 13th or 14th century. And second vandalization was uh, after the invaders, that is 15th, 16th century. And the <clears throat> second restoration is very well documented. It is by Brahmendra Swami. And it involves constructing the three uh, lime plaster spires. And then there are amenities for worshippers. There is a tank and there is uh, there are two or three places where they can get water. So <clears throat> what are the visual clues I'm talking about? There are uh, Adam Hardy has uh, based on the architecture, he would say that the central Shiva shrine is about 1125. And uh, because we don't know what caused the first destruction. And this we can work out backwards when was the first restoration, because we know that the second attack by Alauddin uh, Kilji was in uh, second, uh, that is 1306. That means the restoration must have been between 13th and 14th century. And the last one, which is Brahmendra Swami, it is voluminous and it is published. And then because I am not sure of the my own ability to uh, comment on all the aspects, I have had uh, two or three Zoom meetings with scholars, including Dr. Padiga, Dr. Ramar Zoshi, Dr. Zamkhedkar, and I have uh, given what he also agreed with me, is that it is a Bhumija, uh, the central shrine is Bhumija, and he says the Peter also uh, tallies with that and everything else tallies with that. So there we are okay. These are the beautiful uh, Bhumija motif pillars. These are the pillars in the Mandapa. This is an original pillar, although above it will have been uh, damaged because the ceiling was damaged. So this is also another uh, view, of another pillar. You can see that this also has the Bhumija motif. And I have just put in different types of pillars to illustrate how you can 
distinguish the central shrine from the colonnade pillars. So these are very uh, nice pieces, uh, worked very uh, well and very with great uh, skill. So I'm going to uh, first uh, point, which is the lack of symmetry, which tells us something about the time. Now, this is the plan that was drawn in 1891 by ASI cousins. Then I have put it in different uh, color codes. The spires are 18th century. They are bracketed by the blue border. The original Shiva shrine, this is just the uh, north elevation, the side elevation part. Uh, and the green part, <clears throat> that is the Nandi Mandap. That is also uh, the 13th, 14th century uh, addition. And how do I say that? On what grounds do I base this? Because you can look at the plan as it is drawn by the ASI in 1891. And you can see what I have cropped out of it. It must be remembered that symmetry was sacrosanct in medieval times. And this, the right hand part you can see is symmetrical, not the left. That means this is original, this, these are additions. So on the basis of symmetry, you can see I have separated them. I have got out this and I put it here. So this is the central shrine. And this is all kind of helter skelter. You can see that there are the cells are irregularly distributed. Even the stairs which lead to the these are the old stairs. ASI has since built uh, another set external stairs which enter here. But uh, the number of pillars here there are three pillars on this side, only two on this side, and so it is not. It's most unlikely that this was the original structure. You can see another view. This is the main Bhadra of the temple. It's east facing. So this is the west Bhadra. You can see that it's almost or it is touching the, ex, the extra colonnade pillars on which these triadic panels are mounted. So this also uh, is a clear indication that this is something done later. Here also is another view. You can see these are the triadic panels. These are the colonnade pillars. And the panels, the, the one that at 90 degrees to this panel is one which is almost touching the uh, main shrine. This is another example why there are three pillars on one side and two on the other because they have mounted uh, the triadic panels. There are two fragments and therefore with this crack in the middle, they had to have a third pillar added. And you can see <coughs> the same thing, same panel from underneath you can see where they have been mounted on beams to support them now another example of symmetry now this is the original central shrine which i'm saying is 1125 you can see <clears throat> not only the postures of bhairava and kali are the same but even the sura sundaris on bhairava's uh, to our right here and this one here Similarly, this Sura Sundari and this Sura Sundari. That means everything had to be symmetrical. And look at this now. What has happened is during the first uh, destruction, somehow this pillar, this is intact. This is a southeast pillar. But the northeast pillar was somehow broken. And you can see that it has been up to this part, both are the same. But here it is different and this is similar to the colonnade pillar. That means whoever constructed the colonnade at the same time, the colonnade was constructed at the same time, some repairs were done. So this is another uh, supports that the newly installed, uh, the colonnade pillars were newly installed. This is a view of the colonnade. Here also you can see they're not perfectly in a straight line. Now this is the south colonnade south side of the colonnade. So you can see the main uh, central shrine is on the right hand side. This will be part of the mandapa. This will be the south entrance. This will be the, <coughs> excuse me, Ramayana panel. This will be the Bhadra and so on. This is the north uh, colonnade. And you can see here the Mahabharata panels. We will be looking at them in detail later. Uh, 
again <clears throat> there are pillars flanking the nandi mandap which also have images and you can see although both are supposed to be kali and they uh, in effect are copying everything including the um, scorpion on in her on shown here here also you can see there is a distinct difference in style and for this i had sought dr padigar's uh, opinion and this is uh, on that zoom meeting this is what he said uh, basically he looked at this prabha mandala and he says he can identify this uh, because this was common in uh, in the area of the chalukyas of kalyana which included uh, Uh, this part at that time so they these prabha mandalas were common in 11th and 12th, 12th century and this is the uh, kali from the janga from the central shrine so that confirms the central shrine time and again the other side uh, this pillar of the nandi mandap bears a bhairava image or the uh, this is the antarala bhairava that means this is on the central shrine this is on the pillar and he has also uh, identified that and he says that these uh, this kind of uh, iconography was popular and he says uh, 13th century date would be assignable to this that means the pillars of the nandi mandap are later the central shrine is earlier this is another point this is the only ganesha image in the temple Vainayaki is different. Vainayaki is altogether a different uh, concept. So this is only Ganesha, and he is on the pillar, and he is part of the addition of the 13th, 13th century. Similarly, one of the Bharavahakas in the uh, Mandapa, uh, in the colonnade, has a Ganesha figure, but this also is a later addition. So that is another point that uh, stresses the fact that Ganesha is not there. on the central shrine except for ganesha patti of course that is the uh, on the lintel the lalata bimba now these are <clears throat> further uh, evidence that whatever was around was also destroyed and whatever they could salvage they have used it to support the uh, ceiling and you can see that these are uh, different type of pillars all together you can see these are the uh, this is again enlarged here and there are these surasundaris also fragmented but they are a kind of uh, uh, they lend an interesting touch because you can see that they are wearing clogs something like clogs and not only that this clog uh, this is a photo by amar that he has taken this in detail and you see how intricate this is the clogs are there then there is a toe peg i don't know what else to call it that holds it and then <clears throat> there are the um, toe rings zodvi also so this is a, a not from this temple but it is from somewhere else and it was done very well when it, wherever it was and i'm just uh, this is just as a by way of a flippant comment I'm saying, who were these people that allowed uh, these Surasundaris uh, to wear clogs inside the temple? And this is the one that wearing is wearing that. Then this is the central dome, which is even uh, most of the figures are gone, but this particular drummer is playing, and she is wearing those clogs. Whereas the janga part, the central shrine janga part, this she is also playing a percussion instrument, but she is not wearing any. shoes so these are small differences that tell you that some things uh, okay this is an example of the pillars of the nandi mandap again there are different style not only that they have been uh, they have <clears throat> there are beams installed here which are misfits you can see that this part of the figure is gone here part of the figure is gone here so that also tells uh, us that <clears throat> these fragments have come from somewhere else but these are again well made fragments you can see uh, this is brahma you can see the goose here uh, this is uh, likely to be indra because you see the vajra and the airavat here so these were carved well but they are not from here similarly these are figures 
and uh, you can see that they were portrayed as being in some sort of a balcony and you have the instruments they are holding on the outside. You see this one is blowing a, uh, an ins wind instrument and that uh, you can see the instrument here. And you can see this is probably Saraswati. You can see her uh, manuscript and uh, you can see her hands beyond uh, on the our facing our side of the balustrade. <clears throat> this I have added just because look at the way she is playing. They are showing their, uh, you know, uh, expertise. I mean, she's playing the drum with crossed hands. I mean, she's playing this side with this hand and this side this, this, with this hand. So different uh, simple things that they like to add small touches. And <clears throat> I'm going to show you a lot of images of, uh, for a lack of better word, I can use, I'm calling them siddhas. But they are not necessarily Nata Siddhas. We don't know what kind of Siddhas. But they are Siddhas in that sense. But they are later editions. Why? Because uh, they are all placed on top of the uh, beams supporting the ceilings. So therefore, uh, the brackets are the part of the first restoration, 13th, 14th century. And these Siddhas are located there. Plus, they do not bear the marks of their identity. These are human beings, so uh, they will not have Ayudhas, but you usually have the fish for Matsyendranath. For Gorakshanath, you show uh, a cow is shown. So none of these bear any any uh, symbol like that. And these are some of, to illustrate my point, the location. These, these This is the Mandapa pillar, and you can see these uh, siddhas are inserted here and here you can actually see the joint where the, that panel has been inserted here here also you can see that it had because you can see the heads are destroyed so this also is brought from somewhere else but because of the lack of this part it is falling short so it has been uh, this is a stopgap measure to fit them again this is the roof of the the new roof Again, they are all above the beams. And here, actually, this is the main <clears throat> sanctum. The sanctum also, this has been uh, this was probably broken. So they have inserted a panel right in between with sitters. Again, this is an uh, intrusive panel. Same thing again. Lots of them. There are 70, 80 figures of sitters. Again. You can see them there at the top. And you have some interesting, uh, like this one is in a particular pose. I cannot identify it, but yes, Vijay Sarade has, and I think Amul Bankar, they have identified the pose. It's a Hatha Yogic pose. And this is a Nagarjuna who was a Raseshwar Siddha. I mean, he is not the Nagarjuna of the uh, Buddhist uh, clan. He is a Nagarjuna who was a Raseshwar. Again, the hoods show that is one symbol. Therefore, you can identify this one Siddha. So, um, how do you say, how can I say that, why was it built? I, I think it was built because this was the early Natha period. This was just the dawn of the uh, Natha period. And uh, their main aim was to make sure that knowledge is available to everybody at large, the whole society at large. And therefore, uh, and guiding society, that means they wanted the person or the people to look at things and understand and then make their own judgment as to what is the correct uh, code of conduct. So therefore, I'm calling it a prabodhana or the case studies. Um, and I'm going to have enough time only to look at the uh, Mahabharata panels here, not the Ramayana panels. But uh, this, the way they have been depicted, they exhibit excellent mass communication skills. Okay, and I'm also taking uh, the uh, help of uh, Dr. Devangana Desai's thesis that he, she has, uh, with her uh, monumental work on Khajuraho, has shown that the sacred art, the changes in the sacred art were linked with philosophy and ritual practices 
specifically associable with the relevant religious tradition. For example, in Kandariya Mahadev, Shaiva Siddhanta, you can see. In Lakshmana Temple, you can see Vaishnava Pancharatra. Similarly, following in her footstep, I have tried to identify and more or less uh, conclusively identified that Ambarnath Shivale <clears throat> is based on the Shaiva Siddhanta uh, philosophy and ritual practices, and you can see them there. And I'm saying that Buleshwar Shivale, uh, see, uh, this is why I need help from the experts. I have now consulted Dr. M. R. Zoshi, who is an expert, who is a scholar, senior scholar, and who has worked on Nath Sampradaya. And whereas he says that it, uh, Siddhamata is the original name that was given by Gorakshanath to this particular tradition. Eventually, we have uh, we have called uh, them Natha Sampradaya, but the original uh, thing was Siddha Mata, and there the meaning of Siddha is not someone who has acquired Siddhi from Hatha Yoga, but it is different. It is based on this because it has come from Swayam Siddha Adit, Adinath, who has, uh, for, I mean, who has uh, formulated this or who has taught the first, uh, like Matsendra Natha, uh, who has conveyed this. So coming back to my <clears throat> hypothesis that this is a Natha shrine. The central shrine has no Puranic stories. Now that is something that in any medieval temple, including uh, the ones at Kajurao, whether they are Vaishnava or Shaiva, uh, even Ambarnath, you always have Purana Kathas portrayed on it. Here there are no Avarana Devatas on the wall, only human musicians and dancers. And <clears throat> Whereas on uh, Ambarnath, you have on the vestibule wall, that is Antarara wall, because it's a Shiva temple, on one side you have Ganesha, on the other side you have Kartikeya. Here you have Bhairava and Chamunda, and it is known that Bhairava and Kali are the uh, two uh, forms that the uh, this Sampradaya uh, worships. Worships in the sense, um, uh, they are used for their uh, dhyana and <clears throat> there are five empty niches so there is no way of knowing what which images were there inside but these two things definitely point to this is something different <clears throat> not the usual medieval temple and then uh, the base is also very simple and elegant there are no naratara gajatara and all that only you have goddesses with their attributes and only in one quadrant you have some surasundaris uh, the small ones and uh, the walls the cells that line the walls of the enclosure have bhairava on the lalata bimba and chamunda at least on one and the siddhas are there and there is no erotica anywhere although it is 11:25, <clears throat> no erotica Plus, the sort of clinching fact factor would be this <clears throat> Dwarashaka of the northern uh, entrance to the porch. You find at the uh, on the Udumbar, on one side you have Murali Dhara Krishna, on the other side you have Balarama. And it is known that Nathas uh, and Krishna Bhakti is synonymous in Maharashtra. Mind you, these are regional uh, effects, regional uh, preferences. And uh, <clears throat> again, I'm just uh, pointing out some things that with Tala at Pandur Pandarpur, uh, that image also bears a Shiva Linga on the head. And you can see why it is so uh, popular with the Varkaris and the Nathas because he is a two handed god. He is not holding a chakra, Gada, Shankha. And he is called Panduranga. Panduranga means fair one. Whereas Krishna is supposed to be, I mean, Uttal is supposed to be an avatar of Vishnu, he would have been dark. But Shiva is Karpura Gaura. So in a way, this combination is like, in a way, representative of Harihara Aikya, perhaps. And uh, so uh, it is said that perhaps uh, Dere had also, R.C. Dere has also said that maybe Sh Shakti Yukta Shiva, there is no, no uh, question about this. Everyone accepts this, that this particular religious uh, sampradaya 
their highest uh, uh, deity is a Shakti Yukta Shiva. So he is the Guru. But Sri Krishna can be the Upasya Daivat and they're the Vari that they perform, which is just uh, last week or a few days ago it was there, is the Sadhana Marga. And Dr. M. R. Joshi, again, I take help from his book <clears throat> to ascertain whether Nathas were here at that time. So he says that 11th century first half, that means that is about the time 1050. This Nathapanta had not entered Maharashtra, or at least it was not very popular. But he says, specifically says that Goraksha Matacha Prasar, 1035 to 1130. That means here it was just starting. It was not Prabhavi. It was not that popular or effective. But by 1130, it was established. Plus, he also adds <clears throat> that Matsendra and Goraksha, and there are 15 Nathasiddhas he has uh, identified as belonging to Maharashtra. And they have given Acharya Dharma, that means not only the philosophy, philosophical thoughts, but also how to behave. And uh, he has also again said that uh, this, uh, with reference to the Sri Krishna or the Murali Dharan Balaram, he says Sri Krishna Nama Sankirtana was uh, emphasized by Gahini Nyanta also, who was the guru of uh, Nivrutti Nath, who was the guru of Santanyaneshwar. And this, uh, I have stumbled across something else while I was doing this because according to Dr. Zoshi, I, I was likely to find some connection to the specific branch of the Nathas which would tell me what was their way of worship. So uh, I was looking for <clears throat> looking at Sangavateshwar. He is a very well known um, because he comes, uh, he was the one who met Dnaneshwar, he came riding a, a, a tiger and holding a snake as a whip. His uh, inscriptions, I mean, not really inscriptions, they're, uh, they're called Lagulek. That means there are small just names written there. On Harish Chandragarh, there is Tangavateshwar. At Saswar, there is actually a Tangavateshwar temple. And Pur, that is Narayan Pur, which is at the bottom of Purandargarh. And Vedapur also has these uh, mentions of Changavateshwar. Now, why? What is the connection to the uh, CSMVS in, uh, image? This is Purandar. And this is the image that is there right now in CMS, uh, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vastu Sangrahale. And I have given here only the top to illustrate how intricately things used to be worked out. This is because Hari and Hara are both there. Normally, if it was Hari, then there would be Brahma and Shiva. If it was Shiva, then it would be Brahma and Vishnu. But this is both combined. So, there only Brahma is there. And on one side, you have the Trishula of the uh, Hara part. And this side, you have the Gada of the Hari part. And these I have again shown in this particular image. Can you see how how much in detail they work? Because this is the Hara part, the, the earrings here are Sarpa Kundala, whereas these are Makara Kundala, which are associated with Hari. And <clears throat> the very fact that it is from the Narayaneshwar Mandir, Narayaneshwar means Narayan plus Ishwar, that means Hari and Hara. So this is fitting that this is the Hari Hara uh, image. And this is the Narayaneshwar Mandir uh, at Narayanpur. Pur is a shortened form of Narayanpur. And you can see how the destroyed temple is still, the remains are still there. So this was one connection. And I have another <clears throat> connection that I have put in because I um, wanted uh, to share my thoughts with you. This is something, uh, those who know the history of Panipat, you know that uh, there were two uh, families from the Peshwas that were uh, those were uh, those were killed during the war. One was Sadashiv Rabhav, who was the uh, son of Chimaji Appa, and the other one was uh, Vishwas Rao. Vishwas Rao was killed. His uh, body was found. He was cremated. But Sadashiv Rao's there was some doubt. 
about whether he, his body was found, etc. But it so happens that uh, I uh, met met this uh, scholar named Pravin Bosley. He is uh, searching all the samadhis of all the warriors. He has uh, so far, I think, 350. He has identified conclusively and published them. So he found a mutt. Jaya Guru Gorakhanath it says and Dada Bishada and it, it is Sadashivra and it's in Sandhi that is the town of uh, the village of Sandhi in Rotak in Haryana. That is uh, what appeals to me is that uh, the legend is that maybe he was uh, legend is it is known that he, he died on the uh, battlefront in Panipat but initially only his uh, body was found, his head was not found, but the body was identified because of the marks and the jewelry and the pearls, etc. But uh, after the both the parts were found, they were cremated and then they wanted to have the ashes um, put in some place where they could be, you know, the uh, rites could be performed every year. So you need some place. So they made a murder. And this concept of a Satpurusha, that means Nathas are not necessarily only Siddhas, but even Dr. Zoshi I have heard referring to Satpurusha. That means a, a something equivalent to, a, uh, in vernacular it would be saint, a Santa, but it is Satpurusha. And Sadashivra, in the, this is all well documented, he is the first Mahanta, is listed as the first Mahanta and 12th in line is the current month. That doesn't mean it is known, it is proven that he had died there. But this just tells you that even in 1761, that uh, concept of what makes a Nath was there. So now I'm going to go to the nonverbal mass communication skills. And I'm showing you uh, some of the Mahabharata panels. Now I've heard people say, okay, okay so what big, what's the big deal? Every medieval temple has Mahabharata panels. But they are missing the point completely. It's like saying all schools have teachers. There are teachers and then there are teachers. So Buleshwar panels are special and they're obviously chosen after much thought. Because when you think about it, Mahabharata has more than 100,000 verses. And there are 18 parvas, 18 chapters. And to sift through all this and come up with only 18 episodes which will serve the purpose that the Acharya had in mind. It was Prabodhan through case studies method. And this was presented, it was meant for the illiterate simple folks. And I just call it instead of BCE and I'm saying before common era is before www dot era because they had no other way to verify whatever they wanted to verify. So this is what they uh, have done, the Nath Acharyas. And I found a very nice quote from an 1888 lecture by uh, given, delivered by Dr. Bandarkar. And at the title itself, the critical comparative and historical method of inquiry as applied to Sanskrit scholarship and philology and Indian archeology. span so he quotes Banas Kadambari where it is mentioned that Queen Vilasavati uh, was going to the temple of Mahakala for hearing Mahabharata read. So he, this, these are his words. This shows that our present custom of reading that work and others of its kind in temples for the edification of visitors, these are his words, existed in the middle of 7th century after Christ when Bana wrote. So this is the part that I have uh, uh, cut out from the elevation, side elevation. Uh, this is the entrance and this, of course, you cannot see it, but this is where Murli Dhar Krishna and Balarama are there. This is the north porch door. On one side of it is the uh, all the scenes from the battle. On this side is the Adi Parva. So, uh, Location also, you must understand that if they wanted to, these are meant for people who are outside because this is natural because uh, in those days, everyone was not allowed to enter. So what good is it to have panels in, inside the mandapa if the uh, pub, 
you know the common people cannot see so they are put here and there's enough of a corridor in front of it so that people can sit and think about it and listen to a discourse and even after the discourse is finished they can ponder about these whatever stories have been told so and this is uh, and richard slatter the art historian says that the job of the art historian and i'm calling this uh, preceptor priest as the art historian was to organize the huge inheritance of culture to make the past available to the present to sift the imaginative original and admirable from pedantic conventional and, and superficial so that it is available to men who necessarily live in one small corner of the world for one little stretch of time and finally to enable them to judge the actions of the present by the experience of the past so this has been done to perfection by the uh, acharya here and uh, remember these episodes are not stories about god protecting uh, a devotee but men interacting with each other competing and fighting each other and resolving the issues themselves and restoring peace there are deeds performed by humans in a battle and for a man life is a battle where conscription comes automatically with birth so the battles fought here are not only the ones fought on the battleground with weapons but also situations in life where one has to fight the odds so uh, there are in all three panels uh, the adi parva panel has 11 episodes and i must emphasize that many of these episodes that are depicted here are not seen on other temples because the intention here is not uh, like amar chitra katha go on telling stories but it is to pick and choose and convey the relevance of the episodes and adi parva panel especially uses size to convey relative importance because you must remember these are humans there is no shilpa shastra dictating the size relative size here the acharya has used that uh, liberty to display arjuna in different size depending upon his actions then there is bhishma parva panel with only three episodes and then the war panel has uh, four episodes and each one of them uh, illustrates something different this is the outside of the mandapa this is the east facing wall and this is the north facing wall so you can see bhishma parva is here drona parva karna parva shalya parva is here and on that side is the adi parva so we'll start with the adi parva and i'm giving you uh, the whole panel compacted size and you remember please that these are not sequential in the in the sequence that they appear in the uh, epic but they are carved where they could fit so therefore the first episode is here second is here uh, and so on third is here and fourth is here fifth is here like that and i am going to talk only about a, a few of them so i am going to talk only about the second one this is the draupadi swayamvar episode Uh, where drushtadyumna uh, and drupada announce and this is uh, draupadi where, uh, waiting with a varamala number 4 now notice this i have also enlarged uh, photos afterward this is also arjun and this is also arjun and this is also arjun so arjun appears in episode 5 episode 4 and episode 7 and in all these he has <clears throat> he is shown in different sizes here also this is something i could almost challenge uh, people to show me a panel like this where you uh, you wouldn't think that it is important that when uh, after arjuna won draupadi and the lot of the uh, kings were disappointed and uh, they were uh, raring for a fight with uh, drupada so because pandavas were incognito Dhrutara and uh, Yudhishthir thought it better that these twins and Yudhishthir quietly left the uh, place, so that the five would not be spotted together and recognized as Pandavas. So this episode, I, I am sure, is not there. 
when there are only a, uh, 11 episodes from Adi Parva, this episode would not be there. So therefore, these are the uh, enlarged photos. This is the uh, Arjuna as Batu. Arjuna appearing as Batu. And this is, uh, oh dear. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, am I audible? Yes, ma'am, it's good. We oh, can hear you. Okay, no, because my phone is also ringing. I thought maybe you are. Yes, ma'am, there's some sound in the background. Oh, that's my phone ringing. Somebody's trying to. But that's my landline. But anyway, I'm not going to answer. It's too far away. Uh, so this is the fourth episode where you have these. Uh, see, uh, Arjuna had gone, the, all the Pandavas had gone incognito. They had gone as Brahmins. So they were sitting with the Brahmins. And when all the uh, big kings had failed, he got up to say that I'm going to try. Can I try? And this caused a lot of discussion. This man is turning around and gesturing that how is it possible that when big people have failed, he would succeed like that. So therefore, he is shown in a very small size. Whereas after he wins Draupadi, he comes back when he's leaving, he again comes and uh, pays his respects to them and now you can see in the second episode Draupadi is the same size but Arjuna is a different size he is here much bigger because he has shown his uh, ability so therefore this is what I'm saying that how to portray what the people should ab absorb is the relative importance and here, this is again a kind of a, a free thought. I mean, uh, you need not take it uh, very, come take it with a grain of salt. But this is the episode of the Draupadi Swayamvar. Now, Draupadi is being brought for the, uh, the groom is already sitting there. This is the usual fire. This, even today's weddings in Maharashtra, we have these uh, Gaurihar. Gaurihar, that means these are piled, uh, uh, image, uh, piled, uh, water vessels like they're supposed to be auspicious and the Torana of course but there is a man who is dancing but there's a Chhatra above his head now I have given the relative uh, the related um, shlokas in the next one because who is this person is it possible that this is included to stress that Draupadi had been won by Arjuna by the way this is Yudhishthira because he being the eldest was married first and uh, there is uh, Padma Sajdev has written a uh, uh, she has written a long poem on this uh, and she says Draupadi is sitting there for the wedding next to Yudhishthira and she is looking at Arjun but Arjun is sitting there with downcast eyes because he doesn't have the courage to um, you know uh, look at her or uh, you know so because Maybe she is also resentful, he is also uh, resentful, but he knows. And this is what I have given the justification that uh, although there are uh, supposed to be dancers, etc. in the festival, but this chatra, these are the small signs that the uh, Acharya has put to make sure that identification is correct. So this is Bhishma Parva. Uh, how much time do I have? I have a lot, long way to go. Um, uh, ma'am, you can see um, around 20 minutes more. Do you think that should be okay? Okay, okay. Well, if it is not, I'll stop when the time is up. So, this is the Bhishma Parva. The importance here is that these warriors, their the images are fallen, images are gone, but their flags are still there, and that is what helps identify. So, whatever the reason the flags were used in the war. Here they are serving a different purpose. See, this is, uh, uh, we all know that Kapi Dhvaja. This is Hanuman. And this is Krishna Sarathi. So this is definitely Arjuna's Rath. And this is a Makara Dhvaja. And this is Bhishman. Actually, this is not supposed to be the Dhvaja according to the uh, Mahabharata Shlok. But the... Uh, the uh, Acharya, either he was following a different manuscript or he has used his own uh, thinking because uh, here again, this side now is the Makara, here again is Bhishma and this is again uh, Krishna, Parthasarathi and Kapidhvaja and there is Shikhandi in between. So this is the 10th day of the war 
and both places bhishma has makaradhwaj makaradhwaj is not the one that is listed but this seems more relevant because bhishma was the son of ganga he is gangeya he is also he calls himself apagasuta apaga means a river so he is the and then ganga the vahana is a makara and therefore it seems more logical that bhishma should have a makara flag this is just one example uh, these are the uh, this is the uh, yuddha parva you have four episodes one from the drona parva one from the karna parva one this is also from the drona parva and this is from uh, shalya parva this is what i'm going to discuss in uh, a little more detail that this was a dharma yuddha that means two people had to had to be well matched and they had to use the same weapons okay now uh, they had to be they had to use flags because in that battle with so many chariots elephants horsemen and everything so so much dust how could you identify an opponent unless you had a shimmering flag flying high above the chariot so therefore uh, mahabharata mentions all their uh, flags but sometimes you wonder whether there was an, a sort of tongue in cheek uh, comment on their uh, that person who had the flag for example ashwatthama his flag was the tail of a lion now who would choose the tail of a lion maybe because ashwatthama was the son of uh, dronacharya and here was a lion and he had uh, this son was really nowhere up to the mark karna his symbol was a golden chain for an elephant and that is absolutely fitting because uh, when you view his status vis-a-vis -vis duryodhana you see that he is like an elephant but he is tied because of the golden chain and so on so uh, uh, this one's uh, shikhandi's uh, no ghatotkach is also portrayed now ghatotkach's flag is not uh, shown there because he is shown standing and fighting but he is the son of hidimba and uh, his flag carries a vulture and vulture would not be so inauspicious for uh, because he is a tribal so uh, these are the different uh, flags that are listed and he had a large red headed vulture drona had uh, kamandalu now i want to show you this episodes now this is the uh, dronavada episode i'll skip the others if there is not enough time because this is very very i mean unambiguous uh, you see this is dharma yuddha so this is one chariot this is the flag staff this is the warrior this is kamandalu which is uh, what was there on the dronacharya's flag this is drushtadyumna so the warriors are uh, fighting in front of each other their stance is also the same this is his left foot this is his right foot he is also this is his uh, left foot this is his right foot they are fighting but what happens after the uh, the rumors of ashwatthama having died when that reaches drona he puts down his weapons now what does drushtadyumna do he puts down his bow and arrow but he grabs a sword and a shield and he jumps from his chariot onto drona's chariot and in spite of everybody telling him please don't please don't he cuts off his head and throws it in front of the under the horse's uh, hoofs so you can see how much in detail i mean you cannot miss this episode or uh, identify it in any other way and this is again this is enlarged to show you the flag uh, symbols this is uh, because he was born of the fire and agni and ram agni is vahana is ram so agni his father's symbol is there on his flag and this is um, dronacharya's flag <clears throat> this is an enlarged uh, picture and ghatotkach also this you can see initially uh, in uh, one of the first seminars in 2010 or 11 <clears throat> i had thought this was bhim but then i realized you see this uh, hierarchy and uh, this uh, uh, distinction um, was very much prevalent you see this is ghatotkach because he is not wearing a crown he is jatabhara you can see he is uh, an adivasi he is a tribal but look at the power 
look at the grip he has gripped an elephant i've enlarged it here it's become grainy but he has gripped the rear leg of an elephant in his fist and he has uh, sort of turned him upside down and is swirling him to throw him away now the this is this is the importance why is he here that is because they had to the acharya wanted to stress that this is in the drona parva this is before karna is uh, karna and arjuna stand before each other confront each other uh, what happens is he is hidimba because hidimba's son when he uh, hidimba finally fell because karna had to use his uh, shakti that was given to him by indra and then when everybody else pandava they were all uh, they had tears in their eyes vasu deva krishna is jumping with joy and so when he asked arjuna asked him why he says don't you see i have made sure that karna wastes his shakti on ghatot kacha because krishna knew that uh, arjun could not uh, could, couldn't last in in face of that shakti so these are simple things so now i come to the triadic panels if there is an enigma uh, most important enigma at buleshwar this is the one they are connected to sadhana which is internal worship and this again goes back to devangana bens uh, uh, this thing about ritual context of sacred art that is why they are there and you also understand that <clears throat> regardless of how much uh, formless you want to worship uh, this you need an image you need some sort of a manifested form of the supreme being even that is why even in a shiva uh, temple you need at least the linga the linga means by the way a chinn also so and what i have here or what buleshwar has is nine panels of triads of goddesses and one of a triad of bhairava and the central image in each panel is larger than the other two images and then there are the vahanas sometimes are there sometimes are not there again that itself is an indication that um these are not there from original uh, the vahanas may not have been there originally later added and the ayudhas also they do not correspond to any matrukas and uh, they there are toranas framing them decorative arches and i have uh, given only a few sample panels but uh, sadhana by the nats did not involve worship of a physical image it was internal sadhana yet uh, somehow it has connection to sadhana that is what i feel so these are the panels mounted on top of the colonnade pillars and you can see that this part is later uh, showing up but this is the original part the central goddess is larger the two other side the goddesses by either side are smaller and there are volutes and in each of the volute is a yogi so this is uh, this is panel number 1 this is panel number 2 there are nine panels like that and this is because vainayaki is uh, part of the panel therefore it is uh, something very unique but definitely these are not matrukas so they are part of although i'm calling them vainayaki maheshwari brahmani because their vahanas are shown this and their ayudhas don't necessarily match but the mouse is there for uh, vainayaki and these are different asanas these are different asanas the yogi is in the volutes and this is the one which is the composite because and because of that it had to have this uh, extra pillar installed but the sadhaka is shown here and sadhaka mind you is almost the same size as the seated goddess he is not really very small or anything and the, this part is also very different this part is also different this is the only makara with a rider on so therefore these two are from different parts this is the enlarged uh, sadhaka you can see that uh, you see he is not seated there he is not offering uh, anything he is just standing there this is again another panel with vainayaki but this time this is kaumari because you can see the peacock vahan so and this is vaishnavi because this is garuda and the yogis again you see how much i mean how much attention to detail they all have different uh, 
uh, asanas, different poses. This one I think is actually, uh, it's his back that we see here. And the crowning part is the ten, the three, uh, the triad of Bhairavas. And here I have reproduced something that I do not understand. And uh, Abhinav Gupta has said the following about the installation, Nyasa. That means when you're trying to visualize, when you're trying to worship, internal worship, you have to visualize an image instead of having an image in front of you. So when you do that, you have a Bhairava Sadbhava in the uh, central lotus. And uh, to his right is Ratishekara and to his left is Navatmana. And these, they have the properties. The properties that are there are uh, in the goddesses also. Para would be the center. Ap para, Apara and Parapara. And the uh, the central one is benign. This one is kind of mixed, but this one is definitely uh, more on the uh, Agora side. Now you can see even the two Bhairavas here. He has Damaru and Trishula and a cup. And he has a Khadga. He has a Naramunda. He has a Katyar. So this is definitely tallying with the qualities that are they, they're supposed to have. So uh, I'm saying that uh, although the central shrine is datable to the 12th century, uh, early 12th century, and it was associated with the Natha tradition, actually, according to Dr. Zoshi, I, I should be more specific and maybe perhaps say Siddha Mata, but uh, I have not understood, I do not know the philosophy, I do not know the deep religious uh, thoughts, but all I can say is that they will remain a riddle, these panels, until new evidence is found. But these panels are as important as an undeciphered manuscript. And this is something I have reproduced from uh, one of the publications with permission from uh, Dr. Uh, Alexis, uh, Professor Alexis Sanderson. Here, these are the three goddesses, Para, Apara, and uh, Parapara. And this, uh, this exactly says that the Mandala throne and the three goddesses enthroned upon it, upon it as visualized. So these are not really physical things, but he is the yogi while doing his sadhana, he is visualizing them. And it was just my contention that perhaps a novice would require initially something like those images. So I'm coming to Buleshwar uh, Brahmendra Swami connection. And this again, oral history, I uh, think it is important because uh, this Gaha Kare, Bharat Itya Mandar, has noted that 1929, when he went to Buleshwar via Marshiras, there were no hotels or anything. Then he stayed with Narayan Sakharam Tambe. Now, this is 1929. This gentleman was born in 1929. He is Nana Tambe, he is 92. And he told me, the oral history he was saying, that his grandfather, this Narayan Sakaram Tambe, used to tell him that Brahmendra Swami originally was in Konkan, but when he came uh, to uh, this side of the Ghats, he went to Jezuri for worship. And while there, he noticed a distant hill and a temple. When he was told that it was a ruined temple, he came to uh, look at it. And he was absolutely, uh, absolutely captivated by it. And he uh, collected a hundred thousand rupees in those days. And he built the Nagar Khanna and the spires. And uh, he was also the guru of Chhatrapati, uh, um, Chhatrapati Shahu Maharaj and Bajirao Peshwa and Chimaji Appa. Mind you, Chimaji Appa is the father of that Sadashivra Bhav that we saw. So, he uh, he had told Chimaji Appa that you will win, you will conquer the Vasai fort. And he said, and when you do that, you please make sure that you send 125 gold coins and a silver mask for Buleshwar. And the mask is still in the custody, uh, not Tambe family, the other family. And uh, it is still because of the current uh, scenario and the uh, danger of uh, theft etc it is only brought out on special occasions now and this is this is the uh, thing that is available correspondence available uh, saying that bulobala mugut gala and now just one last uh, hurry this thing it's a very unusual panel buleshwar has a whole beam um, depicting the katha Peter of Bruhat katha Bruhat katha was a, a, a 
story written in a set of stories written in Paishachi language, which was the language of the Vindyaranya people. And there is a and uh, this is mentioned by Dandin. This is alluded to by Dandin. Uh, because Dandin's father was a uh, grandfather was uh, in the court of the Vakataka, so he knew about Vindyaran, etc. So perhaps the perhaps the Acharya also was familiar, he was maybe from that region, I don't know. But uh, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but the, these were these were translated in Sanskrit, late, uh, but then only when the British authors translated them and published them in Europe and they were really, they caught fire, they were like they're on fire, you know, so then they became more common for us. And the story is, uh, this is just of interest because uh, this involves the Satavahana king who was not very well read, but his queen, one of his queens was, and when they were doing Jalakrida, <clears throat> she was tired and she says, Modakaihi Paritadayamam, what it means was ma udakaihi paritadayama. That means do not splash water on me. Whereas because the king didn't know, he thought he says, hit me with modakas. Modakaihi paritadayama. And then that led to a lot of uh, Mahabharati, I would say. But the point is, eventually, when the king uh, was given the uh, manuscript, he rejected it. He said he didn't want something like this. And uh, then here I should uh, read this that uh, he had written the uh, thing and Gunadhya was very disappointed when his uh, magnum opus was returned. So he lit a fire and he took out the folio, each folio he would read and cast it in the fire. And all the creatures gathered around him and listened to him in rapt attention and they forgot to eat or drink. Here what happened was the king fell ill. Because uh, the Vaidya said he is eating fresh but sapless meat, dried up. So then they traced it back. Why is it sapless? And the hunters said that the, these animals are not eating or drinking. So their meat is sapless. So then the king suddenly woke up and he went to uh, uh, Gunadya. And Gunadya said only one story is left. So he gave him that set of stories. It's a huge story. I mean, it's like the Arabian night. One gets into the other like that. But... Then he got it translated and uh, this is, uh, I'm sure that such a panel doesn't appear in any temple, at least not on this scale. So this is the entire panel. You see Gunadya sitting in the middle, he is taking each folio and burning it and you have the animals. There's an elephant, there is a tiger, there is a horse and there are monkeys and birds in the uh, trees and there is a snake and so this panel is there. So that is another unusual part. And this is the enlarged part where he's sitting there with his poti, the manuscript, and he's casting one each each folio to fire. And you have uh, the elephant, the monkeys, etc. Uh, okay, and this is just the connection to Marchiras, which is the town next to uh, Buleshwar. That is where Gahakare and the Kares uh, were there. Now, what is important is in looking for connections, you find there is a, uh, a temple called Kotai. And the Kotai temple has a Mahishasur Mardini image in it. And this is the image from the Kotai temple. And this is the uh, image from the Janga or the Buleshwar. And you can see they're very similar. So definitely there was a connection even in at that time between the two. Thank you. Okay, Niranjana. Dear Dr. Kanitkar, I thank you on, for the insightful lecture on the architecture of the Bhuleshwar temple and answering the questions that our audiences had. Um, I also thank you, uh, thank everyone for joining us for this interesting talk and hope this lecture has inspired you to look into this medieval marvel and hope you will read her book. Thank you everyone for joining us. <laughs>